Tensions are running worryingly high between Germany and the United States. The bone of contention is a gas pipeline joining Germany and Russia that is nearing completion. The Americans call it pandering to Putin and are threatening crushing sanctions if the project is not stopped. So, on to the point, we ask, US sanctions against Germany, how dangerous is Nord Stream 2? Well, thanks very much on joining me uh, here on To The Point, coming to you from Berlin. And my guests here in the studio are Kirsten Westphal from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, who says Nord Stream 2 has serious political implications, but the collateral damage of US sanctions is far-reaching. Also with us is Michel Tuman, foreign policy expert with the Berlin-based weekly Die Zeit. He argues that Europe's quarrel on Nord Stream 2 is the biggest failure in German foreign policy in more than a decade. And a warm welcome too to Eric Kirschbaum, author and journalist who writes for the Los Angeles Times. And Eric believes that the US and many other countries have long warned Germany about the perils of Nord Stream 2. Those warnings were, however, ignored. Well, thank you all three once again for being here in Berlin today with me. Kirsten, I would like to begin with you as an energy expert to tell us what makes Nord Stream 2 so important and so very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would say the political um, con, um, the political context attached to it. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's an economic project with, with an economic basis linking the r big Russian producer with its major market in Europe. But of course, it ha the project has high political implications. And well, this has been used by many as a, as a symbol. So. Mm -hmm. Eric Kirschbaum, for a long time this story has been sort of on the back burner. Now it appears to be boiling over. Why? What's going on? Well, in Germany it's been on the back burner. Germany's been ignoring this for a long time. President Obama warned about this. Trump warned about it. Congress has been talking about this. It's not but just Trump. it's just Trump. an economic project. No, it's more than just, just, well, that's what it's Germany's just an economic saying. project. Germany called it's not it that. political. Merkel <laughs> called that, but it's obviously a political project when uh, the West has you, sanctions against Ukraine since uh, uh, Russia since the Ukraine mm -hmm. um, problem in 2014. So it is a political issue. Germany can call it what it wants, but it's not just Germany versus US. It's also Ukraine mm -hmm. against Germany. It's uh, a lot of Eastern European countries. Poland is upset about this. France was upset about this. Um, it's basically a project to shaft the Ukraine and keep all the oil, uh, gas going away from Ukraine. So Germany has just been ignoring the complaints and the noise out there for five or six years now. At so least, nobody should least, be surprised yeah. that it's coming to a boil now. This was this is uh, an accident waiting to happen, and they should have known it's going to come. Coming to a boil. Three U.S. senators have uh, have told German citizens and others to, quote, cease activities supporting the construction of the pipeline or face potentially fatal measures. That is very aggressive language. These are three senators from gas producing areas, so... It's very aggressive language to yeah, an ally. Absolutely. These are senators. These are only senators, so I don't think you need to get too worked up about that, but Congress was had a very strong majority in voting for these sanctions, so Germans are making a mistake to think it's only Trump versus Germany and Trump may be gone. Mm -hmm. No, Trump may be gone, but the next president is, going, is probably going to be singing the same tune. Michel Tuman, uh, the German side have been saying, they've been talking about this, uh, the, the, these comments or the letter from the senators as, uh, as neo-imperialist, a declaration of economic war. Is that all hot air or is that meant seriously? Uh, no, I, I think there is, of course, neo-imperialism is, is a very symbolically laden word, but I, I think there is a consensus emerging in the German elites that is directed against the kind of what they see as an American intervention, interference in, in German sovereign affairs. Uh, I think uh, that both it, this pipeline uh, has been a German foreign, uh, foreign policy failure in so far as Germany was not able to unite Europe on that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, it has opened uh, a breach. It has opened the floor for Donald Trump to uh, attack Germany on that. And what I see now is that this bipartisan approach in America is, uh, is a failure from the American side to understand what's happening in Germany and that they're actually weak 
weakening those who are criticizing the pipeline within Germany. And there are lots of people who criticize this pipeline, including me. Kirsten, can you just explain for us, because it will be difficult for some to grasp, what, 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 on what basis can three congressmen from the United States insist that something happens or doesn't happen in a German port? Well, this is uh, basically the nature of extraterritorial sanctions, applying um, US law to, to, to another state. And this is exactly why this is now, um, is, um, uh, well, the response in Germany, the reaction in, uh, in Germany is so um, huge because this is really seen as an attempt to into sovereign affairs. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's it's also certainly undermining EU regulatory affairs. And is, it legal? Brussels, is it legal or illegal? Um, I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is that this is going much too far. Mm -hmm. both in legal um, terms, but also in political terms. Because in Germany, the background and the reading is that it's a sanction, it, it, there is this letter, but there is a wider range of sanctions. And it's, it's, not, it's no longer clear with all the list of sanctions coming out of the US, what are the motivations behind and what is really the, the contextualization or, or, or even also the, the conditions behind in order to lift. So this is something, and then it is really seen as part of geoeconomic rivalry playing out with mm -hmm. an ally. Mm -hmm. Uh, Eric, I just wonder, I mean, uh, one leading commentator here in Germany said nobody likes to be blackmailed. The, uh, the suggestion is that the Germans are going to push back. Will the Americans be worried? I don't know. I mean, the United States is trying to keep the sanctions up against Russia. Uh, Russia depends heavily on these gas exports. The Russian Treasury gets a lot of money from Germany um, from these gas exports. And the United States, as this is mentioned, is interested in selling liquefied natural gas to Europe. Um, a lot of Americans ask themselves, why are we spending so much money on defense of, of Europe um, when, when Germany goes and spends billions of dollars a year on, on natural gas from, from, Germ from, from Russia? So all these things come into play. Mm. And the accusation, Michelle, that, uh, that uh, Germany is uh, making itself a hostile of Russia, that it is at Moscow's mercy, that this is a Russian <laughs> Trojan horse, not a Greek Trojan horse? Well, see, there was the pipeline Nord Stream 1 uh, 15 years ago. When this pipeline was built, my major criticism was that Germany might become dependent on Russian gas. Since then, more than 20 uh, terminals for liquefied natural gas have been built in Europe. There are plenty of uh, opportunities to get gas from all directions. This pipeline is not dangerous in so far as we need this gas. No, we don't need it. Uh, it is an additional offer. So, and, and, and that is why I think it's, it's simply uh, uh, beyond the point and missing the point that this is a politically explosive project. But economically, if you have the pipeline, there wouldn't be a, a, a major problem. Not even for Ukraine, which has just concluded a treaty with Russia on the continuation of gas deliveries. Um, until 2024, and you can be sure that there will be an additional, um, uh, there will be an additional um, um, agreement after that. All sounds so rational, but at the same time, you are arguing in the statement we had at the top of the show that this is the greatest failure in German foreign policy in the last 10 years. Indeed, because as, as I said, uh, Germany didn't manage to bring Europe together on that. It didn't manage to integrate the Baltic states, the critics of the pipeline, and it pushed through. And I think this is first and foremost something which happened uh, in the aftermath of the refugee crisis in 2015, when nobody in Germany paid attention to what the then economy minister, Sigmar Gabriel, did, who was a close friend of Gerhard Schröder. But it was Sigmar Gabriel who pushed forward this project. And this has been overlooked. And, um, and, and despite the criticism in, initially from many observers, um, including Eric, in, including others, including me, so um, I think uh, this, is, this is something which falls now back onto our feed after five years. Yeah, it surprises me all the time. Germany always acts like the big European, pro-Europe, um, 
But they're ignoring Eastern Europe, and they've been ignoring Eastern Europe for years on this. Um, Ukraine, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, these countries that know Russia well and said, don't do this, but Germany just went ahead and did it anyway. I mean, that surprises me. I, I think there was a certain misreading in, in, in Berlin at, at the very point. And I think the misreading was that Germany itself, the self-perception was that Germany was clearly pursuing a dual strategy of containment vis-a-vis -vis Russia plus cooperation. So, so basically the old pattern of the Cold War. And containment is, 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 is clear because Germany, Merkel, has been instrumental to keep up the consensus on EU sanctions. So this was kind of being the background and why Berlin thought the others would accept within the package of cooperation as Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which was also giving Germany a certain leverage vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Kremlin. And I think the other misreading then was the dynamics inside the EU to go for an energy union um, and to really drive this. And, and, and to a certain extent, you know, it, it, all the um, rhetorics from Berlin around it, it's an economic project, the legal and regulatory background was somehow based on the status quo in 2015. Mm -hmm. And what was ignored was this big push in the EU to change the regulatory approach, to change to deal with Russia uh, commonly. And indeed, then later on, it was not achieved to, to, to have the consensus. But I think, to me, this were the major misreadings on, on the Germans. Okay, we're going to have to talk about Russia's role in all this in just a minute. Let's take, uh, first of all, though, a closer look at the pipeline that is the focus of these rising tensions between the US and Germany. Nord Stream 2 is an ambitious European-Russian energy project. Once completed, the pipeline costing billions of euros will transport gas from Russia through the Baltic Sea to Germany. It runs largely parallel to the existing Nord Stream 1 pipeline. After U.S. sanction announcements in December 2019, a Swiss pipeline vessel suspended operations. Now, Russian ships are ready to complete the last 160 kilometers. At the end of July, the Trump administration further intensified threats supported by U.S. Congress. This action puts investments or other activities that are related to these Russian energy export pipelines at risk of U.S. sanctions. It's a clear warning to companies aiding and abetting Russia's malign influence projects uh, will not be tolerated. Get out now or risk the consequences. Americans fear that Germany will become unilaterally dependent on Russia through Nord Stream 2. Germany denies this and wants to proceed with the project. The USA, many in Europe are saying, is only interested in selling their own expensive liquid gas to Germany. Will there be a trade war between the USA and Germany? Harry Kirschbaum, how far could this, how explosive is this story? How, how, how far could it escalate? Hopefully not to ridiculous levels, but it is a problem and it's up to Germany. The ball's in Germany's court now. Um, we'll, we'll have to see. But it's really, once again, it's not just Trump, it's the Congress. The Congress forced Trump to do this. Trump was originally reluctant to do more sanctions against Russia, but Congress overruled him on that and had a veto-proof uh, passage of, a, of legislation a few years ago. So it's a mistake in Germany to think it's only just because the Americans want to sell some gas here in Europe, and it's a mistake to think it's only Trump and the problem may take care of itself, because it's, it's not going to go away. Michel Thuman, well, uh, you know, the ball is in Germany's court. Should Germany fight sanctions with sanctions? Uh, no, I think it should not, and I think it won't, because um, Germany has no interest in, 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 in fighting uh, America economically over this. And on top of that, it needs EU, an EU response, because foreign trade is an EU matter. So I think there's not a consensus in the EU in the first place. And second, there's not the political will. But there is certainly a political will to, to have a common stance on extraterritorial sanctions. And that is where I see a major divergence of US and European foreign policy in the future. And the US is losing Europe over that, over the question of extraterritorial sanctions. It's becoming a question of, the inter of international relations and how we deal with each other in international relations. So Europe, obviously, and Germany for that uh, specific matter, doesn't like to be put in the same basket like Iran. Also, we have that 
made a difference over the JCPOA, the agreement with Iran on uh, nuclear energy, uh, where also American extraterritorial sanctions are applied, which have leading, which have led to the possibility of having uh, Iran, new, of, of, of having nuclear weapons in Iran in the near future. So uh, this, is, this is, I think, the major bone of contention we will have in the future. And I hope that if, should Trump lose these elections, that Congress might rethink uh, the, the consequences of extraterritorial sanctions in the future. Kirsten, do you want to pick up on that? Yes. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think what um, I would say is it's not clear what is the motivation behind in Washington, so it's a vast range. Plus, it's, to me, it's not clear what is the cost and benefit analysis, because the sanctions do a lot of harm. They do a lot of harm to the energy markets, where we really see a politicization going on. And then it is also a loss of credibility. And, and to me, it's also not clear to look at the appropriateness of means, because where this issue of feeding the beast, I, I would simply say oil is much more important to the Russian budget. What Trump did with the tweets to establish this OPEC plus agreement, which we've seen in, in, in May, has done much more for the Russian budget than, than any gas sales would do. So oil is very important and we don't see moves there. So in a sense, it's, it's, it's really seen in, in Berlin as targeting Germany. Mm -hmm. And it's part of this German-US rivalry. We, ha we haven't mentioned Chancellor Merkel so far. It's interesting that all, all this is, or not all this, is, but the, the focus of the story, or one of the focuses of the story, is, is her own constituency, the island of Rügen in, in northern Germany. Uh, what, what is Angela Merkel's position on all this? She seems to be sort of looking the other way. Well, the Germans' position has been um, pretty much the same over the past five years. And now it's a clear stance against this, this step of the senators. And when... If, if I may <laughs> add to that, I think in 2015, Merkel was preoccupied with the refugee crisis when the Social Democrats pushed for this project. So you have to see it as initially as a social democratic project. Merkel looked the other way and said, OK, it's only an economic problem and possibly underestimated then the consequences this will have. Um, but, uh, but when it came to the question of uh, sanctions, Katza sanctions, extraterritorial sanctions, of course, then she was pressed into that line. And, and this is the problem now, that because of the sanctions, it's so difficult to have a broad, controversial discussion in Germany about that anymore. But there are some signals coming from the German government. Peter Bayer, Merkel's transatlantic coordinator in the foreign ministry, said recently in an interview that maybe we didn't pay enough to the geopolitical implications of this as we should have. So uh, there seems to be some reasonable thinking going on and try to find a way way out of this mess. Um, that sounds naive to assume that, uh, you know, that this was always, that this was never a political, this, this the line, the, it's an economic, it's an economic a business project, not a political issue. That seems very uh, naive. Uh, I mean, the German foreign minister to told Deutsche Welle that he will not allow the, uh, the US to interfere in the way that it has been interfering in this story. What kind of clout does the German foreign minister have when he makes that kind of statement? Probably not very much. Um, <laughs> uh, he, the foreign minister talks a lot, but I, I haven't seen him move, move the needle anywhere, really. Um, he's about the 10th German foreign minister to meet Lavrov in Moscow. I'm not sure he has a lot of clout there. Um, he brought up a lot of issues this week in Moscow with the, uh, the assassination last summer in Berlin, things like that. But I don't think a lot of things have changed. Um, so no German, no real German response. I'm then gathering to the to the worries of the uh, of the likes of Ukraine and Poland. Well, I, I think I was with Maas uh, the day before yesterday in Moscow, wow. and and I can say that basically there was the the usual exchange of niceties and criticism and and. So uh, I, I think both countries are stuck in there. The most important thing is that uh, Germany still is the major organizer of uh, sanctions against Russia in the wake of uh, the Russian intervention in Ukraine. And I think, first of all, Poland, the Baltic states, and also the United States of America need Germany particularly in upholding these sanctions also in the future. So should Germany decide to go along what 
some leftist social democrats or Die Linke or AfD suggest that we finally um, uh, abandon these sanctions, there would be a huge problem in containing Russia. And I think these sanctions, uh, which is uh, widely overlooked, have actually reduced military tensions in Ukraine and have stopped uh, a major Russian intervention in 2015 in what they call Novorossiya, uh, the areas in, in southern, southern Ukraine near Odessa. OK, Kirsten, I'll come back to you in just a second. Let's just move on to uh, the, the, the showdown between Washington and Berlin over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline comes against the backdrop of what almost feels like a breakdown in relations between the two sides, which has been highlighted by Donald Trump's recent decision to withdraw troops, American troops and thousands of them from Germany. Spangdelem is one of five US military bases affected by the troop withdrawal. The American base in the Eiffel region had been a major hub for U.S. operations in Africa and the Near and Middle East. A total of 12,000 of the 34,500 GIs stationed in Germany are to either return home or be transferred to other European NATO bases. President Trump has announced that the reason for this is Germany's contributions to NATO, which are far below the minimum requirements agreed to. Germany owes billions and billions of dollars to NATO. And why would we keep all of those troops there? And now Germany's saying it's bad for their economy. Well, it's good for our economy. Regardless of whether or not Donald Trump is re-elected in November, Germany can probably count on less U.S. support in the future. Yeah. This heavenly situation where we are well off, doing well financially and growing while the U.S. protects us with their military power and nuclear arms in Europe is a thing of the past and won't be easy to recreate. Will NATO be weakened by the dispute between partners? Michel Zuman, that's the question. Will NATO be weakened by this dispute between Germany and the U.S.? Or how, uh, how far will that uh, weakness go? Uh, uh, yes and no. So, uh, first of all, I think Donald Trump is not very good at numbers. Uh, Germany now is contributing to the NATO budget as much as uh, America is contributing. He probably meant the German defence budget, where Germany is below what it has uh, promised in 2014. Uh, and that is a problem, I think. But here we are talking about American troops, which will be redistributed and withdrawn from Germany, which were not part of NATO operation in, uh, in Europe, but actually are part of US operations in the Middle East, in Africa, so not directly concerning NATO. So this is an American issue. Uh, it will be uh, an additional burden to the American budget uh, so it's not true what Trump says. It's not use, uh, serving the American com uh, economy, but it will be a, an additional burden. However, it is a political problem because, the, of course, it, is, uh, it doesn't, doesn't go uh, uh, without noticing in Russia that this is uh, Trump directs this against NATO. So it's more a politically, politically symbolic problem than a military problem for NATO. Justin. Yeah, in, indeed. I, I mean, I think what is so tricky for Berlin is this issue linkage that we're seeing. Security linking it to an econom economic issues like, like also energy issues. And, and this is not the style Berlin used to deal with the issues. It was much more compartmentalized in Berlin. So this, this is also something we're seeing with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project. And, and by the way, I wanted to say something on well, Ukraine and Poland. It's, it's not true how it's um, said um, out of Washington that Berlin didn't pay concerns. I mean, Berlin was very much engaged in the trilateral talks in achieving this agreement that we're seeing now for five years, having transit guaranteed through Ukraine. We've seen um, Germany pushing inside the EU for common um, poly um, energy projects like the Baltic pipe, for example, which is paid from the um, European budget, mm -hmm. which links um, Poland with, with Norwegian gas fields. So this is part of how it's seen in Germany, very, very, in a very sober way of, yeah, 
That's interesting because I was going to say this is you know this all sounds very much like the sort of the typical rational German approach. Eric yeah. is the American at the table. How great is your concern that on both stories we're talking about today about the pipeline and the troop withdrawal, we are playing into Vladimir Putin's hands because that's one of the tropes in the American debate. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Europe divided is, is good news for Putin, and Putin gets, uh, he's happy when NATO is fighting amongst itself, and the United States and Germany are having their, their problems. Hopefully they'll overcome them. But as far as the five-year deal for Ukraine goes, what happens after five years? That's, that's a problem after what happens in five years. So, um, but once again, the whole NATO issue is your, Germany wasn't listening. American president has been warning for a long time. Germany needs to do more for defense, and they didn't do more for defense. And that's why they're in the mess they are now, because Germany wasn't listening to the signals on the Is wall. Is the pipeline going to get built? I, it's going to probably not going to get finished, no. I'd be surprised to see any <laughs> gas coming out of that. OK, you heard it here, folks. Thanks for joining us on To The Point here at DW. If you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, come back next week. Bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>